that we are going to spend with each other. I want to talk a little bit about I've been through the fire. And it is not easy. Uh, those of you who have been in the office since I've been there, uh, been at this wonderful appointment, may not have paid attention to something that sits on my desk. It is a large red button with the words easy marked on it. Uh, I got one for myself a little bit after uh, working with a, uh, an engineer on one of the live recordings I was fortunate enough to assist on and he had this 198 channel or 192 channel console that he would use to record off of his truck and he had one of these sitting front and center and what happens is when you press it that was easy it says that was easy <laughs> uh, that was easy is a trademarked slogan of a company called staples an office supply mega store, if you will. And when it comes to meeting the office supply needs, you're supposed to be able to go to Staples, and Staples makes things easy. There's a TV show I used to watch on a regular basis on NBC called The Office. And the main characters worked for a paper company called Dundler Mifflin. And Dumbler Mifflin was always losing its business to Staples because they were trying to sell paper and office supplies the old school way, face to face, business to business. No Blackberries, no websites, no way to communicate using technology because they thought that was what would happen. But Staples was using this silly thing called the internet to sell office supplies and converted people who had left Dundler Mifflin, left Dundler Mifflin uh, as, a, as a client because Staples made things easy. The website made it very easy. And this ad campaign uh, that Staples came up with won all kind of advertising awards because you just hit the easy button and you got your ink. You just hit the easy button and you got everything that you needed. You hit the easy button and then they started selling the, this, this started off as something just as an advertising prop in a, TV sh in a TV commercial. But people wanted it so much that people would pay for it. I've had this one almost six, seven years now. People, people would pay for it because they liked this plastic or cherry red dome shaped button with easy across the top. And then it transitioned from not just a button to a software. So now if you wanted to go online to order something from Staples, you could download an easy button to your computer. And then you didn't even have to go to the website, you could just click on the easy button on your desktop and get access to everything that you needed. There was a portal to sending in orders and requesting deliveries and getting tech support and handling rebates and outsourcing large printing projects everything became very easy. And I bring this up when I'm talking about the text that you heard from 1 Peter because there are life situations that we can think about past and present that we wish could be easy. There are things that we are going through right now that we may wish we had an easy button for, amen. amen? There are things that we will be going through. There are physical ailments we might just have. Sickness in our bodies that we wish we could press an easy button for and be healed. 
There are relational problems that we have that, well, that we may wish that we could just push a button and everything be all right. There are spiritual things, the church that we have facing these unanswerable questions. Where is God in the midst of a 74 year old person being shot in the middle of the street at random? There are things that we wish we had an easy button for. But along with this standard or this expanded sense of what constitutes suffering, we need to realize that no matter what's going on, everything is not going to be easy. Uh, the Bible says that man born of a woman days are few and full of trouble. We love to say no weapon formed against us shall prosper, but somebody has to be trying to use a weapon for it not to prosper, amen? amen. Uh, we have to understand that, and so Peter is writing to the believers in exile when he writes this letter because they are going through some suffering. Uh, being a believer back during those times was not as easy as it was now. You didn't wake up in the morning and go through a, a wardrobe in your closet and have so many different things that you wanted to pick that in order to make a decision you had to start with what I don't want to wear to put it on. It wasn't easy back then. You didn't have to get into a nice car that you have just washed the day before. Put on a nice suit, put on a nice dress, put on whatever and drive up and eat donuts and drink coffee. It wasn't easy back then. When you came to church back then, you first off, it was secret. They had signs and symbols that they had to put like a little fish on the door to let you know that this was a house of a believer or they had artwork with sheep because the Lord is my shepherd. You had this artwork set up there because the reason they kept it secret is because somebody was liable to run into your church service, beat you up or kill you or take you to jail. So it wasn't easy and so Peter is writing to these people to understand I know times are tough right now. I know you are putting your life on the line. I know you are putting your health on the line. I know you are putting the relationship with your family on the line. But it's for a good cause, amen? And so he talks about these things and this letter is written to the believers in exile. And he starts off and he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And his great mercy has given us new birth and the living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I like that he starts off with that because when you are in these troublesome times, the first thing you ought to do is praise. No matter what's going on, they cannot stop your praise. No matter what is going on with these other people, they may be able to control what's going on externally. They may be able to control what's going on safely. Why? They may be able to control all these things, but the one thing that they cannot control is your praise. No matter what's going on on the outside, you can still have a praise on the inside. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. So no matter what is going through, we ought to be able to praise. Uh, I think about Joseph and his brothers turning on him and he's thrown in the pit and they take the coat from him and I find it interesting that the one person that said no, don't kill him was Reuben. Why did the person that said don't kill him was Reuben? Here you have this person whose life is in danger and the only person that spoke up for him was Reuben. Reuben's name means praise. So when you are stuck in the bottom of a pit and your life is on the line, your sanity is on the line, your peace of mind is on the line, that's what you need to turn to is praise. Praise is not always about changing the outside situation. The praise sometimes is about changing you until the times get better. And so his mercy has given us birth, a new birth, to living hope. Uh, people do not choose to be born. They are giving this life as a gift. You don't choose how you get here, but so you, when you get here, you ought to take it very heavily. You ought to take it with some sort of importance because every breath you take is a gift. And he, and he tells us the praise to the God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his great mercy has given us a new birth to a living hope. 
Ah, he's telling them there that the Christian life has a future. The Christian life has a future. We are not just living for what's going on right now. We are not just living for what's going on in the present, our day-to-day heart. Our Christian life has a future. We have a hope. And it's a hope that is real. We just can't touch it yet. It's a hope that is real, that we, but we just can't touch it yet. Uh, Tertullian, one of the fancy uh, uh, theologians of the time, said that hope is patience with the lamp lit. Anybody can wait for anything, but when you have hope, there is an expectation. And we once we have that expectation, we want to get all that is given to us. Uh, We don't go to an ATM machine, stick a card in, put our pen in, hit $100, and if four 20s come out, we don't just walk away and say, oh, well, that must be God's will. Oh, no, we expected 100, so we gonna get 100. And we're not just gonna drive off. That machine might not ever be the same when I get done with it if it shorts me my money. And that's how we ought to take this expectation out of life. We have an expectation for the good thing. We have an expectation for things to go better. And so hope lives because death cannot overcome it. Hope lives because it does not back down in the face of adversity. Hope lives because Jesus Christ triumphed over death, hell, and the grave. So he's telling these people, even though you've been outside of your homes, even though your safety is in danger, Jesus has conquered all. So in the end, you are going to win. Ah, And it says that these trials that they are talking about are not the normal day-to-day trials, but because they are able to overcome these things. They are able to overcome the fact that they might be a martyr. They are able to overcome that Christians were being dipped in boiling oil and forced to fight lions. They are getting beat up and and tortured and persecuted and kicked out of churches and all of these things are happening and they can still persevere. I think I can persevere in my relationships. I think I can persevere with these financial problems. I think I can persevere with these relational problems. If they can go through all of that and still say, for God I live, and for God I die, I ought to be able to press forward. Nah, verse 6, he says, uh, 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 in all these things, uh, in all this you greatly rejoice through now for a little while for you have to suffer griefs and all kinds of trials. Those are the kind of trials that they are suffering, life and limb in danger. But this, 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 this text here when it says, in all things you greatly rejoice, I'm reading in the New International Version, but the Greek here is a little strange. Ah, the Greek here is a little strange because it's both indicative and imperative. Uh, Indicative is a verb or adjective serving as a sign or indication of something. Grammar denoting a mood or or expressing a simple statement of fact, uh, an indicative move. And then you have the imperative, which is of vital importance, crucial. Uh, vitally important, giving authority, command, or preemptory. Uh, uh, the, the noun means an essential or an urgent thing. And to see that the Greek is indicative, uh, the Greek is confusing in this part because to some tra- to some theologians, because it's both the indicative and uh, the imperative in this word. But what that means is, is when it says in all things greatly rejoice, what it means is you can rejoice and you should rejoice. So it's not an either or thing about it, it's a both and. You can rejoice, so you should rejoice. You can have joy, so you should have joy. You can have hope, so you should have hope. It is a both and. Those things that are going on, no matter what it is, emotional or physical or relational or familial, you can rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And see, the joy is different than happiness. Happiness is external. The joy is internal. Happiness is what's going on around you. You can be happy or sad depending on how much money you have in your pocket. You can be happy or sad depending on who's talking to you. You can be happy or sad depending on how you feel in your body. But when you have that joy, that joy is on you and that can rejoice and you should rejoice is not because of the external but the internal. You could have cried all night long. 
Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So you can cry all night long and still have that joy. You might have sickness in your body, not knowing where your help is coming from, but the joy of the Lord can be your strength. You can have that joy no matter what is going on. You have that joy no matter what is going on on the inside. So no matter what the situation is, I still have joy. That joy is what keeps us going. That keeps us putting one foot in front of the other. That joy is what puts us down when anybody else may have thrown in the towel. That joy that we have because of Christ Jesus fighting this battle for us is what keeps us going. You can have joy of the Lord and be crying in the midst of your circumstances. You can have joy and when you have that joy, you're going to turn adversity to advantage. When you have that joy, you can turn that sorrow into a song. You know, you have that joy, you get that strength, that unrealized strength and be able to push forward. Ah, and it says that precious gold will fade away after time. That joy that we have in what Christ Jesus done is even better than precious gold. I like gold. I like gold. Gold, and not just because it makes something pretty. I like gold because I grew up wanting to be an electrical engineer. And I knew that if you made the circuit, put the circuit parts out of gold, that project or whatever device it was, that cell phone or that calculator or that, that TV, if you put gold inside of it, it would, it, would, it, would, um, it would be a lot, it would be worth a lot more. And not because gold is shiny. Not because gold makes nice earrings and rings and grills. It, 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 gold has properties in it that allow stuff to communicate. Uh, when you run electricity or current through gold, it runs a lot faster through gold than it would copper or silver. And it's saying, so gold has actual value to it. And even though it has actual value to it, actual use to it, even though it goes through a process to get to what it is, God's grace and the, the, what Jesus Christ did on the cross is even more important than that. Uh, it talks about this gold that is refined by fire. Uh, you don't just scoop gold out the ground and put it on your neck. It's got to go through a process. It's got to be heated up over and over again. And the impurities have to rise to the top over and over again and when the person that's working with the gold sees the impurities rise to the top they have to scrape those impurities off over and over again so the gold that's been refined by fire has to go through fire several times and the fire and the fire is hot and the gold the, the maker knows that the gold is ready to be used after it's been heated up after the impurities have rise to the top, after they scraped all that stuff off, the maker knows when the gold is ready to use so that when it looks, when the person looks into the gold, after it's been through the fire, when the maker looks into the gold and can see themselves, when they see the reflection of themselves, they know that that gold is ready to be used. So I look at these trials, I look at being heated up every now and then. When I'm heated up every now and then, some of that stuff that is in me, that needs to come on out is what is coming out. And I look at these trials and let all of that impurity be scraped off so that I can be refined and bent through the fire and come out like pure gold. But even with that, Christ's work on the cross was more important than that gold. Uh, the author has seen Jesus. And is saying that this is about Christian living. In verse 8 when he says that though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Peter had saw Jesus. But now we're moving to a time where there were some people that didn't get to see Jesus. But they still need to believe. I, I believe it's somewhere in John where it says, how can you claim you love God whom you have never seen? But you don't love your neighbor who you see every day. So while we go through these trials, we got to understand that even though we haven't seen Jesus, we still ought to believe in Jesus. Even though we haven't seen the end of the trials, 
we still ought to believe that there is a way out. We may not be able to see the other side of sickness right now, but we still ought to be able to believe. We may not be able to see the other side of having more month than money, but we still got to press forward as we got to believe. We may not be able to see our son coming home, but we still got to press forward like we believe. We may not be able to see our daughter getting off of drugs, but we still got to press forward like we believe. We may not be able to see the better end of our relationship, but we still need to press forward like we believe. Ah, and he talks about this salvation for receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. The soul here is not just talking about the soul, the spirit man that's going up to heaven and all of that. No, this is talking about the whole person, our mind and our wills and our emotions. And so while we press through these trials, we need to be able to understand that we as Christians ought to be working on the whole person. The whole person. So we can't sit here, like it says in James, and we come across somebody that is destitute. Roll down our window and say, be fed and warmed in the name of Jesus. And then roll our window back up and go on about our business. We ought not to, this, this whole thing, the litmus test of a church is whether or not, the, if it closed down, would the community miss it? Or what are we doing for the whole person what are we doing for the whole person it's good to come and sing it's good to come and dance it's good to come and clap but what else are we doing in the community he's talking about this whole person and receiving the, the the salvation and the end result and the salvation of our souls hosanna meant save now not save later so what are we doing, not just in the future, but we got to have our eyes fixed on the future, but we got to be taking care of the present as well, amen? amen. Uh, we ought to be able to do this for Jesus, because he did more than that for us. Uh, we ought to be able to take our trials and tribulations, because he took everything that was, was supposed to be our punishment and took it to the cross. Uh, uh, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised, for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace is upon him and by his stripes we are healed. So no matter what's going on, we got to be able to press through because Jesus was able to press through for us. He pressed through out of eternity and put on human clothes. He pressed through this whole life of, of learning what it was to be hungry and cold and thirsty and have friends to turn their backs on you. He pressed through that life and never said a mumbling word. He pressed through all the way to the cross, all the way to Calvary, all the way to Golgotha, all the way to AKA the place of the skull. He he pressed all the way through when he had nails in his hands, a crown of thorns on his head, and a piercing in his side. He pressed through, but he continued to press through after he died. He continued to press through when he got up with all power in his hands. And we ought to be able to press through until he comes again. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open, and we invite you to come.